Geoarchaeologists also needs to be comfortable with the concept of landscape. And behind me, we see the grand landscape of the Lower Salmon River Canyon, which, as you can obviously see, is largely a product of erosion. At the very bottom of the canyon, we see deposits that chronicle the events of landscape change through time. Within these landforms, we see layers that show us specific events, specific conditions, and how the environment of the canyon itself at very, very large scales that we might call landscape will change over time in particular ways. Within these landforms, archeological sites can be held. Depending on the age of the sediment and the type of the sediment, we might find different kinds of sites of different ages distributed not randomly throughout the landscape, but in direct purpose related to how people are using an environment like this. So we're here at Cooper's Ferry, and as you can see to my right, we have some stratigraphy that is layering of geologic units that form through time. And this deposit, this lighter sandy deposit, and this darker, still sandy, but has a little bit more silt, both of these deposits have archaeological materials in them. Now the question that the geoarchaeologist tries to solve is why do these look different? Where did they come from in terms of different parts of the landscape? And also what is the mechanism for building up this deposit? So we can look at the fine sediments themselves, we can subject them to laboratory analyses and figure out what they're made out of what's their sizes, shapes, composition, mineralogically. And we can do that for both of these. But then what we have to consider is that not only is there a natural process of deposition, the addition of material to the site, because it's an archeological site, we should expect that there are cultural modes of deposition also. So here we can see a larger rock embedded into the wall here. And throughout this brown deposit, we see other larger rocks and thousands upon thousands of artifacts. So we know that there are two sources of deposition that create the site. One is natural. In this case, we think this is laid down by flooding from the Salmon River. And then larger objects like this, plus all the different artifacts that are clearly of human design are what we call cultural deposition or cultural formation aspects. So, Nature is laying down sediments, and at the same time as people come here, use the site, do what they do, they leave behind objects, they also are adding things to this deposit. We have natural and cultural site formation processes to consider. So at Cooper's Ferry, the major factors of site formation are pretty much divided into two fields, and that is we have a lot of deposition from the river through time. So in terms of geoarchaeology, we would refer to, refer to this as alluvial deposition. Uh, the river exceeds its bank, it goes out onto the surrounding landscape, and as the energy goes down, it can leave behind sediments that help sites build up. It adds new sediment to the site, causing it to accumulate stratigraphic units. We also get, in the deeper part of Cooper's Ferry, sediments that the laboratory analyses at least indicate that we're looking at wind-blown sediments. These are referred to as aeolian sediments. And their original source may be from floodplain material from the river, but the wind then will whip them up, push them onto the flanks of the canyon, and they can accumulate in layers. Now, wind-blown sediments, especially when they're really fine, can take a long time to accumulate. So sometimes, an aeolian deposit might represent a lot of time elapsed in the stratigraphy of the site. The Cooper's Ferry site is located at an intersection with a major tributary canyon. This tributary canyon is known as Rocky Canyon or Rock Creek, and it drains into the Salmon River, and at its confluence, there's a flat part of the landscape that probably was the deposition of material from the side canyon, plus the main canyon to coming together. This appears to have been very attractive to people in the past, and for some reasons that we can really only guess at, but logically I would think that people might be coming to this place because if you situate yourself at this intersection between a tributary canyon and the main canyon, you have access to two different kinds of ecosystems, a major riverine one and a more minor 
riparian and stream ecosystem. The other thing that's important about this location is that in the Salmon River Canyon, there are very few of these very major tributaries. In terms of the geography of the mind of the Salmon River Canyon, people may have been able to remember this place very easily because it's a very major off-ramp from the bottom of the canyon to the uplands. The fact that we see people storing artifacts in pits here, creating what are called caches, may be an indication that this was a major turning point or rendezvous point for people as they move throughout the country here.